Nature is full of sets of organisms that seem distinct. We look at all the animals and plants we see, and they seem to fall into different groups we call species. But how do we objectively separate them into these species? To make these separations, we need the definition of a species. What is a species, and what makes one species different from another? In reality, there is no single definition of species that works for all situations and purposes. Instead of thinking about the definition of a species, we should think about a definition of a species. And by that I mean, which of several different definitions should we use? Different definitions have existed historically, and different fields use different definitions today. In fact, there have been over 20 different species definitions proposed and debated. Entire books have been written on the topic. Instead of getting too caught up in the intricate details of all these different possible definitions, let's look at six definitions in use. The six we look at will be the most common, and cover the range of different kinds of definitions people use. For each of these, we'll talk about what criterion the definition uses, and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each one. The first species definition we'll look at is called the essentialist or typological species definition. According to this definition, a species is a distinct type of organism that is different from all other types of organisms. Historically, this matches Plato's and Linnaeus' concepts of what a species is. They envisioned species as unchanging and fixed things. Each of these men were studying biology before evolution was discovered, so they had no concept of how species may change into other species, or how they may be blurred lines between the borders of species. Even today, this is technically the definition we use. Whenever a new species is discovered and named, part of that process is to deposit a single individual that represents the species in a museum. This is so that other scientists can check their possible new species against the individual in the museum to see if theirs is different or not. These single individuals are called holotypes. These days, there is a movement towards depositing sets of individuals to reflect the variation within the species, but many species we still talk about today are defined based on a single holotype. The advantages of this definition are that it's intuitive, it seems like common sense that different species are different separate types of organisms, and that it makes it easy to categorize species. Do the individuals I'm interested in look like the holotype? The disadvantage of this definition is that it's wrong. For one, populations have variation, and no other individual will perfectly match a holotype. Also, there are examples where two different species aren't that separate. For example, there are lots of cases of hybrids between what we would otherwise call distinct species. The pictures here show two different species of hawk, and the reference describes the observation of multiple hybrid individuals in the wild. Species are not unchanging and completely distinct from one another. They are constantly evolving and have degrees of similarity based on their shared ancestry and relatedness. To use this definition is to completely ignore how living things came to be the way they are. The second species definition we'll look at is called the nominalist species definition. Here, species are defined as groups of organisms in whatever way is most convenient for the task. Think about the hawk example we just looked at. Maybe color pattern is not that big a deal in some species, and the dark and light colors are just variation within the species. This kind of color pattern is common. It's seen in plenty of other organisms, like the peppered moth, for example. On the other hand, maybe the people who study these hawks can see that there are lots of other differences between these two types of hawks. And if these groups rarely ever mate, then the hybrids are just weird special cases that obscure how distinct the two different species really are. Knowing which of these two scenarios is correct means knowing the details of how these organisms live. The decision about what is or is not enough to define a species means deferring to the experts, and we should leave it up to them to decide. The advantage of this definition is that it matches actual use and practice. In the real world, this is usually how we decide which groups are different enough to warrant being called different species. The disadvantage of this definition is that there is no philosophical or theoretical foundation. Without some clearly defined criterion other than opinion, the decision about which groups are different species can vary between researchers. In fact, within the taxonomic community, the group of people who name organisms, there tend to be people who are splitters, and some who are lumpers. Splitters will tend to break variable groups into different species much more readily than lumpers, who are more inclined to call these just different populations in the same species. Obviously, this definition isn't really great for ensuring objective science in the long term. It's time we thought about some definitions based on more than just opinion. Our third species definition seeks to make our definition about species more scientific with numbers. Species are groups of organisms in regions of amorphospace, a multidimensional region using different phenotypes as axes. Since species are different from each other in some way, all we need to do is measure the values of the traits that are relevant, and the members of different species will group together with each other and apart from other species. In the figure shown, the three species differ in their values for two traits, and can be seen as three distinct groups in this two-dimensional morphospace. The main advantage of this definition is that it's easy to measure a bunch of individuals and define a species using statistics. 
This allows us to take opinion out of the equation. Another advantage is that this definition also fits our intuition that species should differ in morphology. Unfortunately, this definition has some problems. First, if we're not careful, we could end up classifying males and females into different species if there is sexual dimorphism in the population for the traits we're using for our morphospace. Second, other phenotypic dimorphisms could result in different species being defined this way. The peppered moth example from earlier, where the only difference between these individuals is a single allele, is an example of this. Third, for species that have wide ranges, there may be considerable differences between individuals at each extreme. Despite this, a zone of hybrids connecting the populations would make it clear that the whole population is the same species. Finally, there are also what are called cryptic species, which appear in almost all measurable ways to be the same species, but they don't mate with one another and are distinct. Drosophila persimilis and Drosophila pseudoobscura are an example of this. They are essentially identical except for a large chromosomal rearrangement, which makes crosses between them extremely rare. When thinking about these disadvantages together, it becomes clear that what's missing from this definition is the importance of mating and reproductive connection. Males and females and black and white peppered moths are clearly the same species because they freely mate with one another. On the other hand, we would consider Drosophila persimilis and Drosophila pseudoobscura to be distinct species because there's virtually no interbreeding between them. The importance of interbreeding we just identified leads us to our fourth species definition, the biological species concept. According to this definition, species are defined as groups of interbreeding or potentially interbreeding organisms. This is often taught as the definition of a species, but that's not strictly true as we've seen. The main advantage of this definition is that it's an intuitive and natural definition. As we saw in the previous example, the idea that highly interbreeding populations should be the same species, and ones that don't should be different species, makes sense. Another advantage is that species defined this way match the populations in population genetics, an important part of evolutionary biology and genetics. Unfortunately, this definition has a number of disadvantages. First, it's hard to test. If two groups in the wild are physically separated, but we think they are the same species, it's not practical to bring them into a lab or a zoo to check for matings. Many members from the same population don't mate in captivity even though they do in the wild. The definition's initially clear criterion is therefore very difficult to test, and negative results have an interpretation apart from species differences. On the other hand, in captivity, members of what we call different species are known to mate and produce offspring. While often these are sterile, like the offspring of tigers and lions, that's not always the case. Two species of macaque, as genetically distinct from each other as humans and chimps, have been shown to produce fertile offspring, for example. Second, there are ambiguous cases in nature. There are sets of populations called ring species, where a series of neighboring populations interbreed, but by the time the sequence loops around to the start, the two populations don't interbreed. Are they the same species, because there are intermating populations at each step, or different species because they don't mate when in the same place? You can see more about hybrids and ring species in our video on hybridization on this channel and the Evolution Examples website. See the link below. Thirdly, there are a bunch of species that this definition isn't useful for. How can we use it with extinct species? Fossils don't tell us about mating behavior. And what about asexual organisms? Since none of them mate with anything else, is every individual their own species? These problems are why the biological species concept, while very useful for many cases, is not the definition of species used in biology, it's one of several. The next species definition is called the phylogenetic species definition. In this definition, species are the smallest definable monophyletic groups. Recall that a monophyletic group is one defined by an ancestor and all its descendants. In the figure to the right, the taxa B and C could define a monophyletic group if we include their ancestor. The set of B, C, and D could also define a monophyletic group if we include their ancestor. However, we couldn't use taxa B and D but not include taxon C to describe a monophyletic group. If you're not sure about these terms and concepts, check out our set of phylogenetics videos on this channel and on the Evolution Examples website. This definition has several advantages. First, if we can make accurate phylogenies, this provides an unambiguous method to define what a species is. Second, this definition emphasizes the historical nature of species formation and relatedness. It's always good when the definitions we use remind us of the process going on and lead us to think correctly about the system. In contrast to the typological definition, which practically forces people to ignore evolution as the explanation for why species exist, this definition keeps it front and center. Third, this definition has practical applications to wild populations and conservation biology. We can take DNA samples and identify whether at-risk populations are distinct monophyletic groups representing a whole different category of genetic diversity or species, 
or whether they're a set of individuals that are pretty much the same as some other group or species. If you've heard of DNA barcoding, this is what they're doing when they try to create a DNA barcode for different species. However, this definition also has several disadvantages. First, it can be hard to do the work required to define species this way. It involves DNA sampling and sophisticated computer programs to make the phylogenies. Most seriously, trivial differences can create different species because a single synapomorphy can define a species. Is a population with a single unique synapomorphy really distinct enough for us to classify it as a separate species? Our last species definition is called the evolutionary species definition. A species is a group with a shared evolutionary history independent from other groups. This definition is focusing on what it is that makes species in the first place. It's the independent evolutionary history that leads to phonetic differences, shared synapomorphies, and separate breeding pools. This definition has several advantages. First, it's good for paleontology since it allows a species to change morphology over time and retain the same name, unlike the phonetic definition that might require name changes as morphology changes. It's also obviously better for extinct species than the biological species definition. Second, this definition works for asexual species where the biological species definition doesn't apply. Strains of bacteria or viruses that remain similar due to shared environments and histories can be classified in the same species, even though none of them mate with one another. However, this definition also has disadvantages. Although it's good that it allows a species to change over time and retain the same name, there's an arbitrary distinction between the continuation of an old species and a new species arising. At what point did Homo sapiens become Homo sapiens instead of retaining the name of one of our ancestors? The real problem with this definition is that we're back to ambiguous terminology again. There is no single perfect definition of a species. We've looked at six attempts to place a label and strict definition on these groups of organisms we see in nature. To some degree, the problem is that nature doesn't fit neatly into simple categories that we can put labels on. However, what all these definitions are striving for is to describe something we know exists. We recognize a similarity and connectedness in populations of individuals with a shared evolutionary history. They're obvious in most cases, like the difference between hummingbirds and elephants, but they can be challenging in others, like the difference between red-shouldered hawks and common black hawks. What makes our idea of a species different from other labels used to name organisms is the scale we're thinking about. A species differs from more arbitrary larger categories, genus, family, order, class, phylum, etc., by being the smallest cohesive unit. Species themselves are the building blocks of these larger categories. Which criteria we use to name the larger categories is clearly based on opinion and subjective criteria, but we have a sense that there is something objectively different about different species. The challenge is to figure out how to define that difference. Defining species is not a trivial matter. Like nature, it's complicated. But this complexity is a big part of what makes biology and biodiversity so endlessly fascinating. A high-resolution PDF of this screen is available on the Evolution Examples website, along with links to other videos we've made about evolutionary biology. Share this video if you think it's interesting, and subscribe to see more.